Hello and welcome to the online part of our lecture course Advanced Statistical Physics of Physics 8310 You know me as your lecturer This is the first lecture will be Grand Canonical Distribution Examples of Quantum Gases and the same title probably will be true for the second lecture so we consider different systems. This is very brief outline of lecture one. I will consider ideal quantum gases. It means that the particles do not interact with each other. Quantum means that we will be using the grand canonical distribution that takes exactly into account quantum statistics. An elementary particle, what meant by elementary, is that they don't have internal degrees of freedom, such as rotation or vibration, have only translation degrees of freedom. And if you need at any moment, we can add internal degrees of freedom later. I will start with a brief introduction, be reminding you about grand canonical approach and working formulas derived from it. As an example, an application of Gibbs Grand Canonical Distribution, I will consider theory of ideal gas of photons, also called black body radiation. It's a traditional name for it, because the problem of energy distribution of black body radiation was formulated before quanta was introduced. So it's a much older name. That they will get photons. A photons are quanta. And that will be crowned by deriving Planck distribution. It's one of the most important formula in the history of physics. And that gave rise to quantum physics. It was the first formula of quantum physics. I'll comment on it as we go, but at the end. The last slide will be history. I will give you excerpts from Relay and uh, Planck and explain why Planck was called reluctant revolutionary. And said this, without further ado, let us This is the first substantive slide. I'll remind you about summation rules of quantum mechanics. And the formula for the summation over state was obtained in the class. We can see the particles, elementary particles, as I said, they don't have internal degrees of freedom. So they have only momentum and energy. And energy depends on momentum in simple power relation. A is a constant coefficient, and alpha is a constant index. So that covers all particular cases that we will need. And the summation rule that we derived is the following. Sum over basis set I, and this is set chosen more or less arbitrarily in Gilbert space to cover it. Though we always it is reasonable to choose the set in accordance with the symmetry of the system. So if the system is spherically symmetric or is in isotropic state, then it makes sense to use spherical coordinates. If it is a cylindrical system, say in, in uniform field, it makes sense to use cylindrical coordinate or ellipsoidal coordinates, and so on and so forth. A certain number of coordinates that are conventionally used in mathematical physics. In this case, we'll be using, to derive this, we used spherical coordinates. So it's summation over quantum state I. Expression depends on I. Expression depends on I. And the result of the summation is following. G is a degeneracy factor, sometimes also called statistical weight. It is 2s plus 1. 
defined by spin S. With the volume of the system, H is reduced Planck constant. Alpha is this index and A is the coefficient. This is integral over all energies of the particle and this energy, kinetic energy, it normally goes from zero to infinity. And this is a weight which we, with which we integrate this expression, the same expression as here, but expressed in terms of energy. And the syntax is 3 divided by alpha minus 1. Again, alpha is this index. Pay attention to this formula numbered. Number referring to these numbers when I need to specify a formula. So let us consider two cases. First case will be non-relativistic massive particles. In this case, epsilon is p square over 2m, which means that a is equal 1 over 2m is this coefficient, and alpha is 2 is this index. And if a substitute that in the summation rule that becomes, so this is mass of the particle, comes to the power of 3 half, this index, this total index is 1 half, this 3 half minus 1 is 1 half, so total power of epsilon is 3 half, and this is this coefficient. Alternatively, we can consider another important case. Those are atrelativistic or massless particles. In this case, epsilon is equal Cp, the C speed of light, and consequently A, this A, this A is equal C, and alpha is equal to 1. And we substitute that, and we get the summation of, of a quantum state is GV divided by 2 pi squared h cube. C cube we have here speed of light, of course. We don't have mass because mass doesn't exist. And we integrate over the epsilon with weight epsilon squared, and it comes from here. It is alpha is equal to 1, so 3 minus 1 is 2. So these two formulas we'll be using, and we'll start next slide with this, using this formula. Of course, we will consider massless particles, which are photons. Here we consider what today is called photon gas. And at the moment when Planck formula was derived in the beginning of very beginning of 20th century, it's called black body radiation. And the origin of this name is because it was known that black body radiates radiates light, infrared mostly at room, room temperatures, visible at high temperatures. The it was known, not known that it is a stream of particles, of photons, that became understood only with the advance of quantum mechanics. It occurs about the same time. So we normally use the term photon gas. So photons are quantum electromagnetic field. An electromagnetic field are described by vectors, by electric and magnetic field. And that means from the point of view of quantum mechanics, vectors are described by L equal 1, the presentation of the rotation group, three-dimensional rotation group. Basically, this harmonic Y1M. And because spin is equal 1, by Pauli theorem, the photons are bosons. Hell, there is a detail. Because the mass is equal to zero, they are transverse fields. So both electric and magnetic field are situated in the plane normal to direction propagation. Correspondingly, 
there are only two projection, normal projection of the vector in this plane present only two polarizations, say x and y, if the direction of propagation is z. Therefore, g is not 12 plus 1 equal 3, as one may expect for massive particles, but for photons, for transverse photons, it's only 2. So g is equal 2 for photons. Now let us see what we need. To describe the magnetic properties, most convenient to consider internal energy, or thermodynamic energy U, and it was obtained in the class. It is given here by formula 4. It's right here. So this is energy of the photon. Mu's chemical potential. Kb is Boltzmann constant, is temperature. This minus is for bosonic field. For fermionic field, Kb would be plus. We can see the bosons. Now, what is important, that number of photons is not fixed. Photons can be absorbed and emitted by molecule and atoms of the walls, of the cavity when this photon field resides. And before the number is not conserved, and mu, the only function of mu is to regulate the number of particles. So you give number of particles, you can find mu. Here number of particles is not, is not defined, so we have to put mu is equal to zero. We cannot put mu positive because for bosons it is non-positive. It is either zero or negative. So we have to put it zero here. That's what was I was telling you. That number of photons is not conserved. And the, we have to set mu equals zero. So setting mu equals zero, instead of general expression for internal energy, we get one where there's no chemical potential here. And it is convenient to rewrite in terms of frequency omega using the general quantum mechanical relation between energy and frequency. What is meaning of this rewriting? It has physical meaning. Physical meaning is whether the field is classic or quantum. It always has a frequency. However, notion of energy of the quantum is purely quantum mechanical notation. So it cannot exist in classical mechanics. Therefore, if you want to see whether a certain formula can be derived in classical mechanics, and exist in classical physics, we, describe, we express everything in terms of classical and measurable quantities. Particularly, we are not use the energy of the quantum, we use the frequency of the field, which is classical. We are not using the wave vector of the wave, we're using momentum of a particle, which is also classical and measurable, and so on. This is meaning. And by the end, we'll see if the formula is free of H, if H eliminates, it can be derived classically. It can, be, it can always be derived quantum mechanically. Quantum mechanics is an exact formulation of the laws of nature. However, some phenomena are essentially quantum mechanical. It means that they cannot be at all obtained in classical physics. They do not exist. And classical limit is limit of h tending to zero. So if h is less somewhere, it will make everything zero. It's, it's, it's a test on classicality of certain expressions. So there are three cases possible. First case, it either expression either vanishes or diverges in classical limit when h goes to zero. Then it is essentially quantum mechanical expression. Second possibility, it has finite limit when h tends to zero. It means that this quantum mechanical phenomena that has classical limit. And the third in case, it simply does not depend on H. It is the same exactly in classical mechanics and the quantum mechanics. And such 
situation exists, particularly the cross-section of Coulomb scattering, is the same exactly in classical and quantum mechanics. What about the internal energy of the electromagnetic field? Okay, we do the substitution. So H will come in fourth power. The third power will come from epsilon cube. The first power from epsilon. This fourth power will cancel the third power in the key and denominator. It will be left with first power in the numerator. Of course, from these two powers, H eliminates. That's what is left of it. It won't eliminate from the expression for exponential. So it's H omega divided by KBT. So this expression does, it, it, as we'll see, it has classical limit. But generally, so when H equal to zero, you can find classical limit. It's called really relate genes formula. But generally, it does depend on H. So this is how the necessity and unavoidability of the strange world of quantum mechanics was introduced into science by Max Planck in 1901, as we'll see later. So we can write the same relation in differential form, simply remove integral. So let hand side is d over d omega, it's amount of energy per unit interval of the frequency omega. And this expression under the integral. This formula is known as Planck distribution. It's one of its forms. It's not an original form, because the original form it is expressed not in terms of frequency, angular frequency. It is expressed in terms of wavelength in the original Planck formula. We'll derive it too. It's not difficult. So this expression d over the omega is called spectral density, energy per unit frequency range. For the equilibrium electromagnetic field, a quantum mechanical or photon gas. In this formula, all quantities are classically measurable. A volume, of course, classically measurable. Frequency is classically measurable. You measure through wavelengths and interferometers. Uh, energy, of course, classically measurable. You can measure it in bolometer. And the fact that this formula contains H, it doesn't eliminate, tells you that it is, cannot be obtained without quantum mechanics. So how did Planck derive it before actual quantum mechanics was, was, uh, was developed? He interpolated between two known results, which we'll have slightly later which is relay genes formula and another one is wind formula. They give two opposite cases, limiting cases. What he wrote they actually was interpolating formula between them. But being a genius, he actually got exact law of nature that later was derived, if I'm not wrong, derived by Einstein, derived from, from, from first principles. And we have we following basically this derivation in process. So this is a statement in blue. It's because of the presence of Planck constant. This is essentially quantum mechanical phenomenon. And the moment it was derived was done of quantum physics. Everything else was based on this idea. By the way, from this formula, comparing to experimental data, Planck found the value of H. Basically, precisely enough to use it today. Okay, we'll find the total energy of the photon gas by affecting integration of this expression over the omega, or equation 6 on the previous slide. To do so, we use a substitution. 
z is equal h omega divided by kvt. So it's always done the argument of transcendental function or exponential is taken as a new variable. Then omega is kbt divided by h multiplied by z. And then from this expression we obtain this energy of the electromagnetic field. Now the integral is dimensionless. The temperature element temperature is a coefficient of the power of four comes from third power of here and the first power of here. And this very characteristic dependence of the energy of the field proportional to temperature in the first order, first power. So it is very strongly depends on temperature. Now the integral of this equation is a standard function. It is three factorial multiplied by zeta of four. And this is pi to the four over 15. And zeta is Riemann zeta function. Finally, we obtain that energy is, so it was pi to the four and pi squared, so the pi squared in numerator, divided by 15 is this coefficient, volume, kbt to the fourth divided by hc cube. Conventionally, this expression is, this quantity is expressed in terms of the Stefan Boltzmann constant. This constant defined the following, it related to this coefficient, front of temperature, so pi squared is written by 60, traditionally not by 15, volume, kb to the fourth, h cube c squared, I bring to your attention, the formula for u is c cube, here is c squared, so u is expressed as 4 times, and 4 will cancel the 60, give me 15, sigma over cc, this is an extra c that was not absorbed by the constant. Kb disappears completely, is absorbed by sigma. Volume t to the fourth. So this is energy of the field. So why the Stefan Boltzmann constant defined this way? If you do it, then we can easily convince yourself that the flux of the field is sigma t to the fourth. To have this coefficient at sigma equal 1, this is what was needed in the expression that contains the strange coefficient 1 over 60. The reason of this, physical reason for this coefficient 4 is that if you take certain play only half and measure energy that is transmitted through a certain plane, only half of the photons move toward the plane and half move the other side. This will give me one half. And then in the plane, not all of them move perpendicular to the plane. They move at random directions. And if you average the transverse speed over the angle, you get one half. It's another one half. And you can easily do it yourself. Now, having derived energy, we can build thermodynamics of black body radiation. The, our variables are T and V. So, it would be good to have not energy, but free energy, because for free energy, Himgold's free energy, T and V are its own variables, canonical variables. Let's make a shortcut to find F. First of all, we find thermal capacitance CV. It is du over dt at a constant v by definition. And if I take the formula contain here coefficient 4 and t to the 4, when I differentiate it, get me extra 4. So 16 sigma over C V T Q. And then we will invoke nurse, nurse postulate that at t equals zero, entropy of any system should be zero. 
And then relation CV is in terms of entropy. T ds over dt. A constant V. Now we can divide by T and integrate over T. Like this. We get an S. And we would integrate from 0. Because when T is equal to 0. Then this integral will be 0. That's exactly property S we want. So the constant by this limits is found correctly. So when we will integrate TV divided by T will give me T squared. And when I integrate, I will get T cube over 3. This is a coefficient of 3. And T cube. And from this we can immediately find fundamental relation as can Gold's free energy. F is U minus TS. So U contains coefficient 4. And this is 16 over 3. So basically it is 4 minus 16 over 3. It is 12 minus 16 divided by 3. So it is minus 4 divided by 3. This is this coefficient. A simple arithmetic. And I obtained a fundamental relation. If he goes representation or in Hermigold's form. So it is a free energy as a function of T and V. And from this particular we immediately find the pressure of the photon gas. It is minus df of dv at a constant T. Just eliminates V. And this is 4, 3, 4, third sigma over C T cube. This pressure very rapidly increases with T cube. This formula actually is important because significant part of the pre internal pressure that keeps stars from collapsing is the pressure of photon gas. Because it, it is inevitably photons are emitted by hot matter of the star and they are confined inside because they cannot escape. Their mean free path is much smaller than radius of the star as a rule. So they can find inside the pressure on the matter of the star from inside. That partly or completely counteracts the gravitational pressure directed to the center and the equilibrium give you property of the star. So this, this formula is extremely important for astrophysics. This radiative pressure we derived in the previous slide is important for a number of phenomena. First of all, for equilibrium of massive stars. As already mentioned, it supplies internal pressure of the stars inside the star that counteracts gravitational pressure. Also, there is a very interesting project of the Department of Energy called Solar Sail. Solar Sail is a, a large area very thin film attached to a spaceship and it catches radiation from sun and radiative pressure of that radiation accelerates the ship. It of course very low acceleration but it's significant in the sense for long enough time, probably more than time of existence of one generation. It can accelerate ship significantly to allow reaching other stars. You cannot do it with fuel. Not enough fuel. Such a rocket cannot take fuel with, with itself. It's, the mass of the fuel is too much. So this is a very, very serious project. It's actually now is being conducted. I know people who do it from from Caltech. Also, similar to the acceleration of spaceships, it can accelerate electrons in solids, and that would be significant for semiconductor. So that pressure of photons exerts force on electron. The corresponding force on electron translates into potential difference. The potential difference can be measured and utilized. It's called photon drag effect, which experimentally was measured. It's a big effect, but it is fundamentally important. Also, it is 
Potom pressures are important for many other problems which I just cannot mention here. Photons are everywhere and therefore it's important. Now we will return to the Planck, original Planck formula, which is by definition the spectral distribution of the blackboard radiation energy, even by, by equation 7 in one of the previous slides. And because you've probably already forgotten it, I will repeat it here without any changes. It's just exactly equation 7. And I don't number it because it's not original. It was already mentioned. So this is the energy, internal energy of the body over interval of angular frequency. And what is important is this dense disproportion of the omega cube that greatly increases with frequency. And this growth with frequency is stopped by this exponential. When frequency grows, the exponential grows and stops increasing this quantity. So this quantity has maximum somewhere. Now, convention to express it in the way Planck originally expressed it in terms of wavelength instead of frequency, it will substitute frequency, angular frequency. C over lambda is linear frequency multiplied by 2 pi is angular frequency. So this is conventional dispersed relation for light. If I differentiate over omega, I'll get d omega, this d omega. This d omega would be minus 2 pi c over lambda squared d lambda. And substitute into this formula, we obtain for the energy per unit volume per unit wavelength. So it would be 1 over V d over d lambda. I'll get this coefficient, 16 pi squared. It comes from the fourth power of 2 pi, third power here, a 1 power here. Lambda to the fifth, lambda cube comes from here, a lambda square of d omega, so lambda to the fifth. This is this exponential expressed in terms of the wavelength. Further, what measured in the experiment is density of the energy flux. So it's energy flux per unit wavelength and per unit solid angle. Because radiation goes isotropically on all sides, makes sense to find also density and angle divided by total angle. To get from energy the density the density of the energy flux, you need to multiply by velocity. It's always to get current from something. You take density of this quantity, multiply by velocity of motion, and velocity of motion is C. Light propagates with speed of light. I will divide by 4 pi to get per unit of the solid angle. 1 over V takes per unit of volume to give me energy density. And this ratio gives me energy per unit wavelength. So this dimensional of this quantity is r per centimeter cube per second. So that's the energy per unit time. This is in CGS units which we will use. A dimensional to NSI units is what divided by meter cube. Again, it's density of power produced by this black body. It is also usually expressed in Planck's original form in terms of original Planck constant H that is related to reduced Planck constant by a coefficient to pi which, which corresponds to relation between linear frequency and angular frequency. This is where 2 pi originates. If I substitute this, I'm getting for the this density of the energy flux a very simple expression directly proportional to H. And also H is here, this exponential. And keep in mind very sharp dependence on lambda. 
This law was first derived by Max Planck and published in a famous paper, probably the most important paper in the development and in the foundation of quantum mechanics. It's called On the Law of Distribution of Energy in the Normal Spectrum, published in the premier journal in, in the world at this time, in Annal and Der Physik, in 1901. For a long time, Germany was leading scientific force in the world. German language was universal language of science, as like English is today. And Annal and Der Physik was a premier journal. That position certainly was not completely destroyed, but seriously challenged by the result of the First World War when Germany lost to allies, Britain and France. But still after the war, during the First and Second World War, German and English were about the same ground as scientific languages and it's a matter of history after the Second War, of course. German language lost its leading positions. Some people even may not remember now in their physique that published not only this paper, but famous paper of Einstein on relativity. In other words, war may be useful to science. It's a big stimulus development of science, though price is enormous. It's certainly not positive for ev every given science. It destroyed German science for long years. Second World War. Now let's return to science per se. We can see that this is a fundamental Planck formula and can see the classical limit of it. So classical limit is always the limit h tends to zero. Also, other words say kBT become very large. Both are classical. kBT is classical energy. You can think about this ratio of quantum energy, Hc over lambda, over classical energy, kBT. So the quantum energy is small, or classical energy is large. It's a classical limit. And in mathematical terms, the argument of this exponential becomes very small. You can present this exponential 1 plus this argument. 1 will cancel with minus 1. And this argument is a denominator, it will go opposite to numerator. So Hc is a new in denominator. H cancels out, C reduces to the first power. And we're getting the expression called religion's formula, which is shown here. One power of lambda also cancels. And this is the famous religion's formula. Interesting that they feel energy density in this approximation. The virtues at small lambda. When I start integrating, this is the integral. If the virtues at small lambda, one divided by lambda cube, and this is so-called a travel catastrophe. So classical mechanics cannot, cannot explain finite energy of equilibrium electromagnetic radiation in the limit of high frequencies. It catastrophically overestimates the amount of energy at high frequencies of small lambdas. And to mitigate it, you cannot have formula that contain only power of lambda. Because obviously power will diverge either small lambdas or large lambdas. Depending on it's more, more or less than one in denominator. This uh, obviously we need a function, which is not power, a transcendental function. But argument transcendental function must be dimensionalism. That calls, that probably was argument of Planck to introduce this constant h. That makes dimensionalism the argument 
build of lambda and temperature. This is how the greatest formula in science and greatest constant in science was introduced. Again, very interesting that Planck himself greatly underestimated his discovery. He considered H as a temporary quantity that somebody who is of greater scientific talent will eliminate and explain. And he was wrong here. There was no greater talent in science than himself. This was the most fundamental science discovered in the 20th century. Fundamental constant, world constant, H, is still in the science. It today is known in, with a normal precision, to, thanks to Hall effect. Given beginning of quantum metrology, it's, it's, it's of enormous significance. And every formula of contemporary physics defines everything in atomic physics, everything in condensed matter physics. We'll go to the next slide. We can see that the, the previous slide, classical case. Now we extreme, consider extreme quantum case. When quantum case when h tends to zero, uh, tends, sorry, tends to infinity formally. Or quantum energy HC over lambda is much greater than classical energy KBT. Then we can take Planck distribution, as I told in this case, argument of the exponential is very large, and it overweighs exponential overweighs minus one in denominator. Minus one can be neglected, exponential goes to numerator with opposite sign of the exponent. We get a formula that has an exponential decay to the size of small lambda. And that is that is the formula, is the first quantum formula derived by Wilhelm Wien. He published in 1896, five years before Planck's formula. Of course, this formula cannot describe behavior at large lambda, cannot describe infrared behavior. So infrared behavior is obviously of this formula is completely incorrect. So in the infrared it gives exponentially small amount of energy. This is dramatic disagreement with the experiment that was infrared catastrophe. And also Wien did not give much value to this constant. He, he just got dependence constant divided by T in the exponent. And he didn't realize that this constant is of fundamental significance. That was done by Planck. Now let us look at the behavior of the Planck distribution. Planck formula that is given by these lines at different temperature close to the temperature of the sun atmosphere. This is about what typical for sun that we see with our naked eye. Uh, 3000 Kelvin, 4000 Kelvin, 5000 Kelvin temperature of sun atmosphere at the surface is about 6000 Kelvin. The, so this is peak of this distribution, it's shown here for 5000 Kelvin, is about all visible spectrum, we show the colors of visible spectrum, from blue, this is ultraviolet, so a black, blue, green, yellow, red, deep red, and that infrared. So this is the range of frequencies that our eyes sees is very narrow part of the spectrum. But it's so beautiful, so much information I give to us. Now pay attention to this black line. This black line is a classical formula, which is related genes formula. And of course this formula has dramatic divergence towards small wavelength. This is ultraviolet catastrophe. 
about which we talk, it is not bad in the area of infrared, for which it is applicable. It's reasonable approximation here, but in the area toward infrared, I'm sorry, toward the ultraviolet, it's dramatically diverse. We know there is real diverse that give infinite total energy, and that's what is called ultraviolet catastrophe. So we clearly see it here with your naked eye. So this probably, again, this is the most important result in the, in the history of science, contemporary science. It is, it's dawn of the quantum era. So at this time we are moving forward. Final slide. It contrasts two points of view. It contains very famous statement made by William Thompson. Is actually better known as Lord Kelvin. It made in an address to British Association for Advancement of Science in 1900. And this is the statement. At the time, at the end of 19th century, the beautiful building of classical physics was about to be completed. And Kelvin said there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. In the sense of precise measurement, he was right, but about nothing new to be discovered in physics, he was completely wrong. And he continued, the beauty and clearness of the dynamical theory, which asserts heat and light to be modes of motion, is at present obscured by two clouds. Look at what kind of clouds they are. One, the first came into existence with the undulatory theory of light. Undulatory theory of light, undulatory means wavy, wave, wave, wave theory of light. Light is electromagnetic wave. And it was dealt with by Fresnel and Dr. Thomas Young. He did well the question, how could the Earth move through an elastic solid such such essential is the luminiferous Luminiferous ether. It was theory that light is a selection of ether, a sound, a selection of, of error. So how come if it is so that it can create a restoring force for electromagnetic, what we call today electromagnetic oscillations, light oscillations, so how can Earth move through it without experiencing any perturbations? And the second, listen to the second. Second has direct relation to us. The second is the Maxwell-Boltzmann doctrine regarding the partition of energy. This is the relay genes distribution for the energy of the electromagnetic field. Look, it's 1900. Next years, the question about Maxwell-Boltzmann doctrine will be decisively resolved by Max Planck in this famous paper. I am repeating the reference to it in Nalander Physik. And Einstein published his special relativity theory that, of course, completely eliminated luminiferous ether. There is no ether in Einstein theory, and therefore there is no reference to which speed of light should be measured. In any system, speed of light is C. It's something. These two gigantic revolutions in our perception of the of the universe, actually, of the, of the nature, was made within a very short time at the beginning of the 20th century. It probably was the most dynamic and tumultuous century in the history of humankind with the quantum theory, special relativity, theory of gravitation, which is general relativity, quantum theory of solids, quantum theory of atoms, which ended but then by the 
by invention of transistors and then discovery of lasers, introduction of nuclear energy, discovery of subatomic particle, use of nuclear bomb, uh, development of uh, rocket technology, rocket propulsion. Think what was done in 20th century. Now we are at the beginning of 21st century. And I hope that we will take into account both positive examples of the, of the past and look attentively because, of course, wars were very uh, dramatic, accelerated scientific development, but they were completely destructive for humankind, killing enormous number of people and eventually hindering the further development of culture and science. So look into future with hope. We come to the end of the lecture. One.